Hello and welcome. My name is Keith Barker, and in this video, we're going to take a look at what the heck is a NGFW, a next generation firewall, to include what it can do, why we need it, and what are some of the common terms associated with these firewalls that we use all over the place today. So for our discussion, let's use this topology as a backdrop, and we'll center our attention right here on this representation of a firewall in the middle of our network. Now, the basic concept of a firewall is to protect, you know, something from something else. So in the case of a car, for example, like a race car, there is the engine compartment. We'll call that right here the engine. And then we have the part of the car where the driver sits. And between them, there's generally a firewall. And that way, if there's a problem with the engine or some kind of fire, the firewall should hopefully prevent that fire from reaching the driver and protect the driver. So the same concept is true with firewalls on networks today. It's protecting part A from part B or vice versa. In our topology down here, this firewall would be used in this example to protect this part of the network from this part of the network. So perhaps this is part A and this is part B, and the firewall can be used to control and protect the traffic flows between the networks over here and the networks over here. And it's more important today than ever to realize that just one device doing that protection isn't enough. We also need to have devices inside the network and software running on our host and computers that are also doing protective services for those devices. And having said that, we're gonna focus the rest of our attention right here on this firewall. And we'll talk about why it's called a next generation firewall here in just a moment. But before we get to the advanced features of a next generation firewall, let's go to rule number one, regarding 99% of firewalls. And that is right here. And the reason this first rule is so important is because when there's a problem with the firewall, when it's not functioning or working correctly, it's usually this first line, this first rule number one, which I think of as rest and relaxation. That's a fantastic way to help remember it because almost every single time that I've done troubleshooting with a firewall, whether it's at my home office or whether it's for a customer, it always boils down to R and R, which is a way that helps me remember routing, address translation, and writes because this device right here as it's being implemented is acting as a layer three router where if a packet shows up at its door at one of its interfaces it looks at its routing table makes a forwarding decision and that's what gets the ball rolling because if a firewall receives a packet and has no desire or awareness or has not been trained to forward that packet it's done our security is done <laughs> we don't need to worry about a packet going from you know this part of the network over to here if the firewall says, I don't know what to do and drops it, very, very secure. But we do want the firewall to be able to route. So the basic concepts regarding IP routing is critical on a layer three firewall, such as this one right here. So very similar to this router here and this router here, the concept of routing is first of all to learn or know how to forward traffic. And that's done with directly connected networks or running a routing protocol or using static routes. And then when a packet shows up, to go ahead and make a forwarding decision. And that forwarding decision is gonna be based on the routing table on this layer three firewall. So as a way of reinforcing that basic concept of routing, let me show you two specific examples on two different vendors implementation of a next generation firewall. And our focus is gonna be right here on routing. So let's start off with this example. This happens to be a Palo Alto firewall. And so on the network tab here over on the left, I've clicked on virtual routers. And if we wanna see the routing table for this firewall, we just click right here on more runtime stats. And each vendor has a slightly different way of you know where to click to see the details. So on the Palo Alto firewall, this is the way we do it right here. So we'll click here on more runtime stats. This is all the possible routes. And in this implementation, the route table is showing us all the possible routes. And if we click on the forwarding table, these are the routes that are actually being used. So in a Cisco environment, this is the equivalent of the actual routing table itself. So here is a default route with the next top of 23.1.2.1. And here's a route for the 162.16.1 subnet. So that's the routing table on this firewall. And just to compare and contrast that, let's take a look at another vendor. And this is an example of another next generation firewall. And this one is from Fortinet. Their next generation firewall is called FortiGate. And to view the routing information, we can click right here on this little widget for routing. And this will show us the current routes that we have. So we have a default route with this next hop. And then we have three directly connected networks, the 68.104.57, the 192.168.1 and the 192.168.181. So on our firewall, the first job is to make sure it can do IP routing. Now, just because it knows how to route traffic doesn't mean that it always will. We'll get to that here in just a moment. The second element that often causes problems is when we fail to do network address translation correctly. So layer three routers and firewalls can both perform address translation. And that would include source address translation and destination address translation and one-to-one -one mappings, which is NAT, and many to one mappings, which is referred to as port address translation or PAT. And so just like on a router that's connecting, for example, a private network like the RFC 1918 private address space to the public internet, 
we have to have some device between the private network and the public space to perform the address translation. So if it's our firewall that's supposed to be doing that and it's not set up correctly, that could prevent traffic from going through. So let me show you a couple examples of using network address translation on a couple different flavors of next generation firewalls. So we'll start with this one. This is a Palo Alto. We'll go to policies. And you might ask, well, why, Keith, are you demonstrating these two specific vendors today? And the answer is, <laughs> I currently have this gear up. So my top four at this moment, my top four favorite next generation firewall vendors are, and these are not in any specific order, would be Palo Alto Networks, FortiGate Firewalls from Fortinet, the next generation firewall solutions from Checkpoint, and also, of course, from Cisco Systems, the Firepower Threat Defense, or FTD system. And even though the interfaces are slightly different for those firewalls, the actual functionality, the goal, is pretty much the same across the board. So here on this Palo Alto firewall, if we click on policies up here at the top, over on the left, we have a section for our network address translation policies. And here are the rules for the address translation on this firewall. And if we compare and contrast that to another vendor, it would look something like this. So here on this FortiGate under policy and objects, we've got a section for centralized source net. And here are these source net rules that are being used to do the address translation as traffic is being sourced on my inside networks going out to the outside world. And in addition to centralized net across the board and all the vendors, they also have options for doing destination net where we're doing the initial translation on the destination IP address. A good application of destination net is if we have the server right here and it's at the IP address space of 10.1.20.100, for example. And then we've mapped that out to a virtual address, a virtual IP address on the outside. Maybe it's 23.1.20.100 or some other address space that we own. And so when customers do a DNS request for the server, they are given this IP address, they connect over to it, and it's the firewall who's supporting that virtual IP address and then translating on the initial flow of traffic the destination address of 23.1.20.100, swapping it out for the destination address of 10.1.20.100 and forwarding it on to the server. So again, the concept regarding source or destination NAT refers to on the initial flow of traffic, what's being swapped out. And on the flip side of that, if we have a user here that's going out to the internet, the initial flow of traffic, if this customer is at 172.16.1.50, for example, on its way out, the initial flow of traffic needs to be swapped out to a routable address before it hits the internet. And because of the source address that we're translating on the initial flow, this would be an example of source NAT. Well, this example over here that we talked about earlier would be an example of destination net. And that same concept regarding address translation is applicable to these layer three devices that we know and love as routers or layer three firewalls. The concepts are the same. And so the benefit is as we start learning these topics regarding a router, we can also apply those same kind of topics to a firewall. So let's presume that we have routing tables in place. We have our address translation rules in place. The third element in making sure a firewall can do its job is the permissions or the rights. Is the firewall willing to forward a packet from this computer as it goes out? Or is the firewall willing to allow a customer who's trying to get to this server, we'll call it server A, is the firewall willing to go ahead and forward that traffic? And that's what I mean by rights. And that's implemented on our firewalls by policies. So we have policies regarding how we're going to do address translation, and we also have policies regarding are we willing to allow that traffic to go through. So the play-by-play -play here is that we have routing information in place, we have policies and rules regarding address translation, and we're also gonna have policies and rules in place regarding permissions. Are we going to allow, even though we can, <laughs> says the firewall, are we going to allow that traffic to go through, yes or no? And if you're wondering, Keith, are you going to show us examples of that on these firewalls? The answer is absolutely yes. Check it out. So I happen to be here on the FortiGate, so let's do that one first. So here on the left, under Policy and Objects, we have a section for Firewall Policy, which is effectively the permission section of whether the firewall is willing to forward the traffic or not. So let's take a look at a little snippet here. And so on the firewall, there's a series of entries, and these are termed a little bit differently based on the firewall. But on FortiGate, they call each one of these a policy and they're processed from top to bottom, very similar to an access control list where it starts going through these policies. And if it gets a match, it acts on it and it's done. So this specific entry is based on traffic that's coming in on this interface and going out on this interface. So let's imagine this policy that we're looking at right here is number one, two, three is number four. So as traffic comes into the firewall and it looks at its routing table, it's gonna check each of the policies in order. So let's imagine there's a traffic flow that didn't match this entry or this entry or this entry, but now it's being compared against this one. So the firewall says, okay, did the traffic come in on this interface? 
And based on my routing table, would I forward it out this interface, which is my WAN 1 interface on this firewall? And then furthermore, in this policy ID number four, it's asking, is this Keith's PC? So if I bring in my mouse and I hover over Keith's PC, this is pointing to a specific IP address of 192.168.1.151. So it's like an if-then statement. So if the traffic is coming into this interface and being routed out this interface and is coming from the source address of Keith's PC, then what do we want to do? And here the action is accept, which in a Cisco world would be called permit. Other vendors might call it allow, but effectively it's saying, yeah, I'm willing to forward this. So that's an example of one entry in a firewall policy regarding the permissions in forwarding traffic. So if this is a match, it's not going to go any further down in the policy. It's going to simply say, well, it's a match. Let's go ahead and act on it. So up to this point right here, it's a go because of this action right here. And as a result, it wouldn't bother processing any further entries below that. Again, processing from top to bottom looks for the first match and then acts on that. So this is an example of a firewall policy or security policy on a FortiGate firewall. Let's take a look at an example of a policy for forwarding traffic on a Palo Alto firewall. So here on the Palo Alto, we'll go to the policy section and then over on the left, we have an option for security. And this is basically the same logic. So for this entry right here, this is saying if traffic is coming into the firewall on an interface that's a member of this zone called the inside, and based on the routing table on this firewall, if the outbound interface is going to be an interface associated with the DMZ zone, and I also have a couple other constraints here regarding, you know, source address and destination address. So based on these considerations, if that's a match, what's it going to do? And let me go ahead and open this up so we can see the details. The action, if that's all a match, is going to be allow. So a slightly different term based on the vendor we're using, but the concept of accept, allow, permit are all very similar. It means it's willing to forward the traffic based on this rule being matched. So to get the ball rolling, that's the first three elements. Do we have routing in place? Do we have address translation if it's required? And is the firewall through its policies and rules, is it willing and giving permission for that initial flow of traffic to go through? And as an example, let's imagine this user right here wants to go out to the internet. So we'll call this user, user one. And so that user one has an IP address, very likely it learned it via DHCP, the computer did anyway, and it has a default gateway. So the default gateway may be this address right here of this router. And then the router based on its routing table, if traffic is going to the internet, very likely has the firewall as its next top address. And then the firewall has its own routing table and very likely network address translation. And then based on the firewall policy and rules, it would then be willing to forward it over here to the next router who would forward it to the ISP router until it got out to the server. So whether the user is trying to go to a DNS server out here on the internet or a web server or something else, that would be the path that the packets would take as it's being routed from router one to the firewall to router two and points beyond. So I'm gonna go ahead and put the server out here. This is the server that the client is trying to reach. And let's imagine that the firewall had the routing in place. It had address translation if it was required. And when I say if it's required, somebody <laughs> uh, between the user and the public internet has to do address translation. So if it's your service provider or router two or router one or the firewall, somebody's got to do it. So let's imagine that the firewall is willing to forward the traffic. It had the routing in place, the net was in place, there was the permissions as far as a policy that's allowing that traffic to go through, and the user is going out to their server. One of the really important things that happens when that initial flow of traffic is going out to the server is remembering. And you might say, Keith, what do you mean remembering? And here's what I mean by that. The firewall is going to remember that session that the user initiated it, that it was permitted, it reached the server, and then when that return traffic comes back, the firewall remembered the initial state of that connection. And when that reply traffic comes back, if it's legitimate and it's everything as it should be, for example, the right ports are involved, the addresses are correct, that firewall will dynamically allow the reply traffic to come back in. Meaning we don't need separate rules or permission for the return traffic. And the reason we don't need specific rules that are literally configured on the firewall for that return traffic is because of the remembering. And the term that we use for a firewall that remembers that state of the session and dynamically allows the return traffic is referred to as a stateful firewall. So if you see a stateful firewall, that's what they're talking about. It's a firewall that remembers the initial flow of traffic and as a result, it dynamically allows the reply traffic to come back in. So if this user was going to a DNS server, the DNS response would be allowed back. If this user is going to a web server and that initial flow is allowed, the reply traffic is going to be allowed back dynamically because of the stateful nature of the firewall. So pretty much any layer three firewall on the planet does those three things using routing, address translation, and permissions regarding allowing the initial flow of traffic, as well as being stateful in nature and dynamically allowing the reply traffic to come back in. So all those functions are not, I repeat, not yet NGFW material, next generation firewall material, because that's the basic functionality on any stateful firewall. However, what does 
bring it up to next generation firewall functionality is a little bit of attitude and additional checks that this firewall can do based on everything else being okay and permitted, additional checks to help make sure that the traffic that is being sent or forwarded through the firewall is okay and allowed and based on company policy. So with that in mind, let's focus our attention now on what are some of the features that a next generation firewall brings to the table that makes it a next generation firewall. And one of those features is application layer inspection. I think we're all familiar at some level with the TCP IP protocol stack. So here at layer one, that's the physical layer. And at layer two is the data link layer. And here at layer three is the IP or network layer. And layer four is the transport layer. And up here, we don't call it L5 layer five. What we call it in the TCP IP protocol suite, as we now know and love it, is we call this the application layer. And some examples of application layer services would be HTTP and HTTPS and things like DNS and SSH and FTP. And the list goes on regarding application layer services. And then all of those at layer four use their associated layer four transport protocol, whether it's TCP or UDP, which are the two major protocols at layer four at the transport layer. And then at layer three, it's always IP. That's where we're including the layer three network information, for example, IPv4 or IPv6 addresses. And it's this layer three information that our layer three routing devices are looking at to make their forwarding decisions. And then the data link layer most typically is going to be Ethernet and our local area networks. And then the physical layer is the physical cables and signals and technologies that are used to actually move the bits through the network. So switches are making forwarding decisions based on layer two information. Routers and other layer three forwarding devices, such as a firewall acting at layer three, are making forwarding decisions based on the IP addresses to forward a packet from this user here to get to the server on the internet that they're trying to reach. So with that in mind, let's take a look at some of the additional features that the next generation firewall brings to the table. And when I think of these next generation features, I think of the concept of, wait a minute, because that really is what the firewall is doing. It's saying, you know, I've got routing in place, I've got address translation, there's permissions that are allowing the traffic, but wait, wait just a second as I check a few other things just to make sure that everything's okay. And we might ask, well, what are some things that it might check on? And one of those would be, application layer services, what's being used, which goes above and beyond just looking at layer four and saying, okay, what protocol is in use and what ports are in use. It's actually taking a look at the application layer services and be able to identify, what is this? Is this Facebook Messenger? Is this Facebook chat or with Google services? Is this Google Calendar? Is this Google Mail? And be able to very accurately identify what the heck is really going on at the application layer. Because most traditional firewalls, they stop at layer four and they just say, well, yeah, it's a TCP port 443. It must be HTTPS. Good, good, good. Let it go. Well, a next generation firewall has the ability to do the additional inspection and analysis of what's really going on at the application layer. And that way you can enforce policy at a next generation firewall and say, I want to allow these specific type of Google services. I want to allow these specific types of Facebook applications and be very granular in our policy. And one of the challenges of correctly identifying applications is this little thing called HTTPS, which is also commonly referred to as SSL, Secure Sockets Layer from a long time ago. Currently, we're more likely using Transport Layer Security or TLS. And HTTPS is fantastic because it sets up an encrypted session between a client and a server. Now, the problem with that on a next generation firewall is that if the session's encrypted, how in the heck can the firewall see what's really going on at the application layer if all that data is encrypted between the client and the server? And the answer is it can't. It can't really do application layer inspection if the payload is all encrypted. So in answer to that, all the prominent next generation firewall vendors use a feature called SSL slash TLS decryption. They may name it slightly differently, but effectively here's what it does. When this computer is trying to go out to a secure website, the firewall actually behind the scenes creates two sessions. It has a session here between the client and the firewall and another session between the firewall and the server itself. It's kind of like an attacker game of man in the middle, except this is a firewall we control. And so for a few moments in the mind of the firewall, it can see the application layer because the traffic is encrypted from the computer to the firewall and also from the firewall to the actual server. But right here for a few moments at the firewall, it's unencrypted and therefore it can see what's really going on at the application layer. So let me clean that up a little bit. So that SSL slash TLS decryption is a critical part in making sure that the firewall can do appropriate application layer inspection. Sometimes that's referred to as AVC for application visibility and control or application layer inspection. I've also seen it written as layer seven 
visibility or layer seven control or a layer seven firewall. In either case, they're all talking about the ability to see what's really going on at the application layer. Another feature that all the big vendors have in place is the ability to get information to your firewall from the cloud. So from the cloud, we can feed the firewall details regarding categories of websites. For example, we probably don't want this user. If that user is trying to go out to a website that's known to be malicious or have malware or other problems, we probably want to have the firewall say, you know what, uh, that website you're trying to go to has been categorized as a malware site or some other harmful activity. And the firewall can say, you know what, I'm going to stop it right there. And it could stop the DNS request from going through and or it could stop the TCP session from being established to a site in a certain category. And that's because of security intelligence. Also, if there's a new outbreak or a new problem somewhere on the Internet, that information can be fed to the firewall so we can act on it. Another great benefit that most vendors bring to the table with their next generation firewalls is user awareness, because we may want to control all the traffic that goes to the firewall based on user identification or what groups they're a member of. So if we want to set up a policy that says people in human resources or people in sales or people in marketing and what have you are allowed to access certain types of applications or go to certain types of websites, we can control all of that because the next generation firewall has the ability to integrate that knowledge. And there's several ways of getting that information over to the firewall. We could use single sign-on capabilities with Active Directory and feed that over. And we could use methods like LDAP for the firewall to ask the Active Directory environment. Or we could do a technique called captive portal, which we've seen often at like hotels and things where users try to go out to the Internet. They're stopped. And then there's a Web page that's brought up where they have the chance or the opportunity to at least accept the agreement or provide their credentials. And that way, the firewall can on the fly ask the user about their credentials remember who they are, and then enforce policy and track that user as they go out to the internet. Another important feature is anti-malware and antivirus support at the firewall. So if we're doing the SSL TLS decryption and we're doing application layer inspection, we can also look for malicious content that the user is trying to bring home. And that could be very you know, innocent on the user's part. They go to a website that's been spoofed, they try to download a file, or they click on a link, and they're trying to download some malware. We want the firewall to be able to correctly identify that and prevent that file from making it back to the client. And once again, that's going to rely on cloud services in the process of getting updates regarding definitions. And also, if there's a file that the firewall doesn't know of and doesn't know on its own, is this malicious or not? It can once again use security intelligence in the cloud and cloud services from the vendor to go ahead and have real time or near real time analysis of that file. So let me show you an example of that in action. So here's a test file from icar.org, or here's a link, I should say, to that test file. And this file is not really malicious, but it's going to trigger as a malicious file. And it's used all over the world as a test. And so here, this is the icar underscore comms. It's even a zip file. So if I click here and try to download that, it's not only a zip file, but it's also accessed via HTTPS. So it's encrypted. But on our firewall, if we've got the SSL slash TLS decryption in place, and we have the anti-malware, antivirus profiles in place, it should identify that file, even though it's zipped, as a malware file or as a virus and should stop it. So let's go ahead and give it a shot. We'll click there on icar underscore dot com. So we'll click on that file. <laughs> and so currently I'm sitting behind a FortiGate and it identified that it was a malicious file. So it's not letting me download it. So it stopped it right there in its tracks. If we go to uh, here's a Palo Alto sample test file and I'll go ahead and click on that. And that's also indicating that it's a malicious file and it stopped it. It prevented it from getting back to my computer. So if we went to the firewall, so in this example, it's a FortiGate. And so it's under log and report. And if you go down to antivirus, it shows right here, 50 seconds and 31 seconds ago, <laughs> that those two files were identified. And it's a very similar process on the other vendor's products as well. So here's a Palo Alto firewall. If we go to monitor on this platform, over on the left, they have a log section for threats. If we click there. And so I had some TCP scans, I had some flooding, and here's a virus right here. So if we click on the details for that, it gives the details regarding that event that happened. So the traffic was coming from 10.1.0.61. The user was Keith, is going out to this IP address. There's the destination port. And if we scroll down in the details, it identified it as a virus. And over here on the left, it has the action of reset. So it sent a TCP reset, which stopped the TCP conversation cold between my computer and that server. And as far as getting a little help from our friends, most of the next generation firewalls, if they see a file and they run the hash and they don't recognize the file as malware or not, they can actually send that file up to the cloud with the service that's being supported by that vendor to go ahead and do analysis of that file. So here are the details regarding that event. And if we click here on wildfire analysis report, that's what the Palo Alto refers to as their cloud services for analyzing files. And as we scroll down, 
It has fingerprints or hash values for the file, came back with a verdict of malware. And as we scroll down, it used virtual machines to do a few tests, came back with the results. And one of the cool things about using a centralized service like that is because the vendor now has identified this and can update all of their firewalls that they have all over the planet. And that ability to do dynamic updates is another characteristic of next generation firewalls that can reach out and get continuous updates regarding virus patterns, signatures, and other intelligence from the cloud without manual intervention by the administrator. Another big benefit of next generation firewalls is the ability to do intrusion prevention. And because the firewall is in line with the traffic, for example, it's in line between users out here on the internet and our servers up here, and it's in line between this customer and the internet, if this firewall sees traffic that seems to be suspicious, for example, a scan where somebody is trying to do a ping sweep or a scan of the entire network or looking for a whole bunch of open ports, if the firewall sees that, it can go ahead and prevent that from continuing. And that way a user here who's trying to do a ping sweep of a remote network, when the firewall sees that, it'll consider that as an attack and it can go ahead and stop it. And again, most vendors have implementations for intrusion prevention services as part of their implementation of a next generation firewall. And the way that many of these features are implemented is through security profiles. So here on this Palo Alto, we've got an antivirus profile section, anti-spyware, vulnerability protection, URL filtering, denial of service protection, and more. And the way these are implemented is if we go back to our firewall policies that are allowing the traffic here in our firewall policies, we simply add those profiles. So if we take a look at the details, let's go ahead and look at this rule right here. So this rule says if traffic is sourced here and being routed here, the action is going to be allow. However, the wait a minute is these additional security profiles that are associated with that rule. So in this case, the firewall would be considering antivirus profile settings and vulnerability protection settings, anti-spyware settings and URL filtering settings, etc before it allowed that traffic to go. And if any of these checks fail, it's gonna go ahead and prevent that traffic from making it any further. And it's a very similar concept on other vendors' products as well. So here are a bunch of security profiles that can be configured. And then we take these security profiles and we attach them to our firewall rules. So if we go back to our firewall policy here on this FortiGate and let's go down to one of these rules. Let's go down to this one right here and we'll open it up and scroll down. On this rule, it says if traffic is coming in on this interface and going out on this interface, and if the source IP address is Keith, then go ahead and allow it. However, the wait a minute is is all of these security profiles also associated with that rule, or in the case of FortiGate, with that policy. So all these additional checks are done, and if there's a problem with any one of them, that can cause the traffic to stop. And in the demonstration we did earlier, where I tried to download a couple of malicious files, it was this profile, the Our Antivirus profile that was associated with this policy that caught it. And we can verify that by going back to the logs. So here under Log and Report, if we click here on antivirus and then look at the details for one of these, we'll go ahead and just double click. Over here on the right, we have the details. And if we scroll down, it's showing us explicitly <laughs> what stopped it. It was the antivirus profile called our antivirus profile. And it's this antivirus profile associated with that policy that identified that file as malicious and prevented that file from being forwarded. So if we look at the actions up here, the action was to block. So it stopped that download in its tracks. So this has been an overview and some examples of next generation firewalls that we currently use today to protect our networks and systems. I look forward to seeing you, my friend, in the next event soon. Until then, be well. What you're putting in All your hopes and efforts Are all in